Wonderful. So thank you very much, everybody, for coming. Um, today, I'm going to be really, as Umesh said, diving into new methods for simulating Hamiltonian dynamics. And at a high level, one of the things that you might think of going into this talk is you might think, OK, this is going to be a quantum chemistry talk. <laughs> uh, it, it actually won't be. Really, the way to look at this is I, I want to show you a bunch of techniques that you can think of as ways of building new classes of Hamiltonians and how to manipulate these types of operations. And these techniques are not haven't just revolutionized our approaches for simulating um, chemistry, quantum field theory, and materials, but they've also given us fundamentally new ways of solving other types of algorithms. For example, there's been monumental leaps in quantum linear systems, as well as methods for solving semi-definite programming, um, as well as uh, differential equations that all have come out of these techniques. And so I really strongly recommend anybody who's interested in quantum algorithms at this point, these techniques have gotten so rich that at least having a basic understanding of how these methods work, I think is essential in order for you to really understand the state of the art for algorithms in general. And so my aim here is to provide you with some of the intuition about what these techniques can do and also when you should choose one technique over another in order to tackle a particular problem. So as I said you know, previously getting in, one of the reasons why you would want to do quantum simulation from a big picture perspective is that it provides an exponential speed up for a wealth of different problems. Now, I'd like to put this in, in contrast to the original kind of killer application for quantum computing, which was, of course, Shor's algorithm. Shor's algorithm, I find a little bit of a depressing algorithm, personally, because, well, first off, it kind of only makes the world worse. You know, in that having your, uh, your bank transactions potentially uh, read over the internet, it, that doesn't make my life any better. And on top of that, because of the existence of quantum resistant uh, cryptography, um, there is actually a real chance that by the time quantum computers come out that are capable of, um, of breaking the currently used key sizes for RSA, we will actually have already potentially moved beyond RSA for most of our critical com uh, um, communications. So this makes Shor's algorithm, if that was our only thing, kind of, you know, a little bit of a dead end street at some point because, you know, the that problem as well as related problems from the say, you know, like abelian hidden subgroup problem are not necessarily going to be used uh, forever. However, chemistry is likely going to be going on forever. And so this is one of the reasons why, from my perspective, simulation really is a phenomenal area in terms of applications. But not just that, it's also, as I said, a very really valuable way, uh, paradigm, for building up subroutines that we need in other algorithms. And I've already mentioned linear systems of equations. But one thing that I also want to mention is that it's very important for, theoretic, for theoretical reasons, because quantum simulation um, methods also give you ways of figuring out how much it would cost to emulate other models of quantum computing on a standard circuit-based quantum computer. So for example, if you wanted to do something like adiabatic quantum computing, which you can view as kind of an idealization of what the D-wave machine does, in order to be able to prove that that model of computing can be efficiently simulated by a quantum computer, you've got to find a way of translating it over. And quantum simulation methods give you just that. So this is one of, these are some of the reasons why theoretically, even on top of these amazing applications, we really kind of want to have simulation algorithms. Now, to give you an idea about what I mean by simulation, this is really important because every subfield, when they hear the word quantum simulation, they have a different notion in their mind of what exactly they mean. For some people, it means finding the lowest eigen, uh, eigenvalue of a, of a matrix. For other people, it means emulating the quantum dynamics of it. Typically, in quantum algorithms, when we talk about quantum simulation, we kind of mean more the latter application. So in particular, what quantum dynamics, the way they're described is that 
let's assume that we've got a Hamiltonian matrix H, um, which is confusing as all heck in quantum computing because we can I can never tell whether H means the Hadamard gate or the Hamiltonian. Uh, and so um, in, in, in some cases, the best uh, rule usually is just think about which option would make the, make the formula harder, and that's probably the right guess. But all joking aside with that, the um, op Hamiltonian itself, for those of you who haven't done much in the way of quantum physics, is you can think of it as sort of like the energy operator for a particular system. It's like an energy function, except it's a matrix because you know we've got to make sure that it, this object is basis independent. So the object that describes how a quantum uh, system ends up evolving is e to the minus iht. This will talk. This will describe the time evolution. This unitary operation will describe the time evolution that an initial state will end up experiencing for period t. And so the, the couple of things are really important for this. You might ask, okay, well, what's the big deal? Why is this so tough? Well, one of the problems is that in general, H is exponentially large. So if we have n qubits to describe the problem, then H is a two to the n by two to the n matrix. And in general, good luck squaring a two to the n by two to the n matrix. So how are we going to evaluate this definition of the operator exponential up here? In fact, actually generically, even if we can figure out some structure uh, to evaluate the non-zero matrix elements of the, this exponentially large Hamiltonian matrix, still figuring out an explicit representation of this guy on the left is incredibly difficult. And so this makes quantum simulation a really challenging compilation problem because of the fact that, well, we don't know explicitly what our target is. But in any case, to give you an idea about what this form of quantum simulation means, I really have want to introduce two worlds to you. And so the first world is the world of the physical system. This is the world of this actual H matrix over here. So this is the world of the system that, um, that we want to simulate. This might be chemistry. This might actually be the Hamiltonian that we're using inside a linear systems algorithm. This could be the, this is the thing that we want. The key thing is, is that we have this evolution starting from some initial state going forward in time to a final state over here. And that's described by this e to the minus iht operator that I was discussing. Now, in order to simulate this, what we do is we take this initial state over here and we have to build a rule. And this rule will translate, allow us to translate between states in the physical world to states, uh, qubit states in our quantum computer. Then once we've done that, we wanna break this up into a discrete sequence of gate operations that will emulate some quantum dynamics going from the initial state to the final state, such that this final state in the quantum computer is logically equivalent to the final state that we would see in the physical system up to some error epsilon, okay? And we ideally would wanna be able to build an algorithm that can perform this compilation and ensure that we can hit our target within an error of epsilon for any user specified value of T and epsilon. And that's the aim. And of course, the, the gold standard of this is what we would like to do is we'd like to have the number of gate operations in here scale as poly of the poly uh, a poly n where n is the number of qubits. And this is really important because as I said before, the size of H over here is like two to the n by two to the n. So having the quantum algorithm scale polynomially with the number of qubits actually often ends up giving us an exponential advantage over the best classical methods. So this is what our aim is with, with uh, uh, simulation. And so, as I said before, the big problem is, um, you, okay, or, sorry, I guess the standard approach that you could do is everybody knows that, um, that Hadamard, T, and C naught are a universal gate set. So if we knew what U of T was explicitly, we could always break it up into those basic gate operations. But as, as I said before, we don't know what U of T is because it would require actually an exponential number of classical calculations to figure out what that matrix is. 
In fact, actually, if you even wanted to figure this out on a quantum computer, it would take an exponentially large number of quantum simulations too. So we cannot use at all brute force synthesis. And so the idea behind all, all simulation methods is to take this unitary that we want to implement as a sequence of gates and break it down into a series of simple subproblems. Each of these subproblems we come up with a specific solution for. And then we combine those subproblems back in order to handle the overall dynamics. Now, there's kind of four broad strategies for this. Uh, the first uh, one that was discovered was uh, Trotter Suzuki formulas. Um, the second are randomized time evolutions. Uh, no, examples of this include the recently discovered uh, Q drift simulation algorithm, as well as density matrix exponentiation. Um, then there's linear combinations of unitaries and uh, quantum walk techniques, which are often known under the moniker of qubitization. In this talk, I'm going to be spending a lot of time talking about Trotter Suzuki formulas, linear combination of unitaries, and uh, quantum walks. If anybody's curious about these techniques in particular, I encourage you to ask me questions afterwards. But unfortunately, with the time constraints, I don't have time to cover uh, all four. I can only do three out of the four. So let's talk about the first approach. So the first approach is a Trotter-Suzuki simulations. The whole idea behind Trotter-Suzuki simulations uh, is, uh, I think, really kind of um, natural. The idea is like, if when you look at me right now in your screen, you might think you're seeing a static or a moving image. The reality is, is you're not. What's happening is that your screen is rapidly flickering at a rate that's faster than um, what your eye can naturally process, or at least what most people's eyes can naturally process. Uh, definitely what my eye, uh, faster than my eyes can process before I've had a cup of coffee or something or if you, those that know me better, a yeah, yeah, can of Coke or six. Um, but in any case, the um, key thing about it is that we, we try to do the same thing with the Trotter-Suzuki formula. The key idea is, let's say we've got H as a sum of Hamiltonian terms. Then the time evolution operator is just e to the negative i uh, sum over j, a sub j, h, j, t, all right? And then what we would like to do is we'd like to be able to use this kind of light switch approximation. We want to rapidly switch between only one of these HJ terms being on while all the rest of them are off and do so so frequently that it seems like all of them are on at the same time. And the way that we do this is basically by using this approximation over here. And R over here just refers to the number of time steps that we end up using for this. And we can see that basically, as we increase the number of flickers effectively that we're, we're using for this, the error that we end up seeing in the Trotter-Suzuki formula ends up scaling like the, norm, uh, the sum of the norms of the commutators uh, times the time step squared divided by r. So by choosing this value big enough, we can drive the error term down to be less than epsilon for any epsilon greater than zero. I, I should mention also, there's been some great work that, that I, I had a small role in, uh, largely by Yuan Su, that ended up showing that actually this formula over here can be generalized to arbitrarily high orders. And so the general formula ends up looking very similar, except if you want to use this for higher order Trotter Suzuki formulas, it will end up depending on more commutators of the individual Hamiltonian terms, but the idea is the same. So the key thing that makes Trotter Suzuki formulas really kind of awesome is that first, they require no extra memory in order to do it. All the rest of the quantum simulation methods that I'm, I'm talking about will require minimally one extra quantum bit. Here, it's literally, it's exactly the same space. The next thing that's really cool about it is that the error that we end up getting in the approximation doesn't directly depend on how big these terms are. Rather, it depends on the commutator between each of the individual terms. So if you have a bunch of terms that approximately commute with each other, then these individual terms are, might be quite small, even if the coefficients in the Hamiltonian are large. 
So there would be some problems like this, as people like Robin Kathari and others at Microsoft ended up showing, that the where the, the Trotter-Suzuki method is much more efficient than any other known quantum simulation method. Okay, but the key part about this simulation is I mentioned that what we do is we break this down into a, a bunch of simulations of e, e, these e to the minus i hj's over here. And this only makes sense if we can figure out a way of implementing each of those e to the minus i hj's. Because otherwise, well, all we've done is taken our original quantum simulation problem and broken it down to our other quantum simulation problems. And you know, and there's no clear profit if both if both the left hand side and the right hand side are equally hard to do. So what we want to do is we want to pick particular H sub J's that have structures that allow us to build quantum circuits to perform the simulation. And so the I question is, well, what kinds of structures can we take advantage of? So uh, Nathan, yeah. uh, there is a question that seems to be relevant at this point in discussion. So the question is uh, whether it's uh, whether the recent work of you and Sue with improved higher order formulas do they yield an advantage in a natural Hamiltonian setting where somehow this appears in physics or some other problem? So one of the things that we were we were able to show with this is that the performance of these uh, of these methods comes very close to tying the performance that we can see for. Um, complicated simulation methods, such as the interaction picture simulation method, which I'll get to later, um, uh, for problems in chemistry and materials. So there are actually physical applications where these higher order methods are formally needed. The big challenge, though, is determining you know, what the relevant constant factors are and precisely when you're going to actually want to switch over to these higher order formulas. And that, that part isn't known yet. Nathan, is there an intuition as to like the dimensionality of the lattice or something that relates to what order, uh, what order formula you need to use? Actually, it, the dimensionality of the lattice doesn't have anything directly to do with it. Um, the only thing that the dimensionality of the lattice can sometimes end up leading to is the commutation relations that you end up getting between the particular terms. So sometimes more stuff will end up commuting with each other if you've got something like, say, um, just nearest neighbor interactions on a 1D lattice, then almost everything commutes with each other and you know you can rock on. But the thing in general that you actually care about more than, more than the dimensionality of the lattice is the typical size of the commutators. So that's the biggest thing. And the, oh, okay, the size of the commutators, the time you're doing the simulation for and the air tolerance you want. That'll determine it. But the exact precise crossover point where the second or where the say the uh, fifth order formula is the right thing to do versus the third order formula, that's that requires a lot of experimentation to figure out. I, I, I see Susan has her hand up. Do you, you have a question? No, I don't. It was an accident. Sorry. <laughs> okay, no worries at all. All right, great. So now let me talk about the kinds of structure that we want to um, uh, exploit. So the key structure that we, we will that we will take advantage of is kind of this notion of sparsity. And so the fundamental idea is let's take a look at this example down here and I'll show you why this particular example is an example of an easily simulatable matrix. So first off, uh, the structure of this may not be totally clear until I do this. <laughs> now I've colored the non-zero matrix elements of this Hamiltonian. And I broke them into a series of blocks. So the diagonal elements the, that are non-zero, I've colored um, uh, green and salmon, and the off diagonal elements are blue and gray. So first thing is, is let's consider building E to the minus IHT. If we square the matrix, well then what's gonna happen? If we square H, we're gonna multiply the green block by the green block we'll multiply the salmon block by the salmon block, and then we'll multiply the blue block by the blue block, so on and so forth. Uh, the, for the square, you can see that each block only talks to other matrix elements inside the block when you do the matrix multiplication. And so what that ends up meaning is that when we exponentiate the Hamiltonian, all we have to do to exponentiate it 
is build a quantum circuit that's capable of exponentiating an arbitrary block. That block doesn't need to know anything about the rest of the exponentially large matrix, only the properties of that block. And so the key idea behind doing this is that what we wanna do is we would like to be able to build a quantum circuit that can identify the salient properties of a block, simulate each of them independently, and then using quantum superposition, if we build such a circuit, it will actually be able to simulate all exponentially many of these blocks in a single application. So that's the key idea behind how we can exploit a property like sparsity in order to be able to uh, do a simulation easily. But to give you a particular example of how this would, uh, this would work, let me show you something that you would see all the time. Uh, and it's one of the simplest Hamiltonians that you can think of exponentiating. So let's think about just trying to simulate a Hamiltonian consists of only one term, which is uh, a times uh, x tensor x. So the strategy that we, we, we have is that this matrix, first off, just taking a look at it, it's of the form. So using that block language that I described uh, before, we can actually see something really kind of obvious or uh, neat that these two elements form a block and these two form a block. So you can see that when uh, that this is a particular case of that of that other sort of strategy that I that I mentioned, uh, i.e. this is a what's known as a one sparse matrix in a jargon. So the the strategy though is that in this particular case all of these blocks are basically identical. So we don't have to actually bend over backwards to think about building a complicated circuit for extracting the properties of each and every block. We can kind of do it globally. So the strategy that we do for this is we would diagonalize the Hamiltonian, which we can do by Hadamard transforming each of the, um, each of the, the poly X bits. Then what we do is we'd like to be able to come up with a, a circuit for simulating it in general. The easiest way to do that is to diagonalize that matrix. And by doing that, we actually see pretty straightforwardly that the eigenvalues of the Z tensor Z operator that we get in between are just going to be uh, negative one um, to the I uh, exclusive or J. So it's just, it goes like the parity of the two bits. And so all we have to do is now build a unitary circuit that kicks the right phase back. We translate then, once we've done that, all we have to do is uh, transform the circuit into the computational basis and we're done. And the resulting circuit that we get by following all of these steps is this guy over here, which you've probably seen many times in simulations for you know, uh, chemistry as well as uh, spin systems. So that's the a particular example, but the broader strategy that you would take, a, a, a take looking at this is the one sparse method that I was mentioning before. Next up, I, what I'd like to do is I'd like to talk about linear combination of unitaries. Now, LCU, to be honest, people have actually been using LCU in a lot of different names and a lot of different contexts for a long time. But the first time that the name was like explicitly used uh, for um, Hamiltonian simulation was in work that, uh, that Andrew and I ended up doing. And this all started because of like an idle question that actually I had one day. And that idle question, which I didn't think would be terribly useful for anything, really was, well, okay, let's take a look at Trotter methods. With Trotter methods, I know how to Im implement them because I can, well, write unitaries, a product of other unitaries. So I know how to do products of unitaries. And the stupid question I asked myself was, well, how would I do the sum of unitaries? And it, turned, it turns out that this, that doing the sum of unitaries is actually really, really useful. The reason why is that when you try to approximate a time evolution operator as a sum of individual terms versus a product like e to the minus i h1 times e to the minus i h2, then what we end up getting in, in this, this case is a mad, we end up getting a series that ends up looking like this. And we would multiply that times one minus i h two plus. So if we want to be able to build up the Taylor series of the um, of e to the minus i h t by the product, 
you end up getting this challenge that all of these terms start multiplying through by each other. So as we're trying to build up the Taylor series for the time evolution operator, we need to control how these this exponentially growing list of combinations for the products ends up actually unfolding. And that's a real challenge. However, when you've got a sum, you don't have to worry about these terms combining together in any particular way. They're just added, right? They're not gonna be multiplied. And this makes building these types of expansions much, much easier using these approaches. And so the, 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 the idea behind all of this though, it can be generalized even further to this notion of a block encoding. So what we mean by block encoding is that what we'd like to do is we'd like to be able to implement the sum of unitaries. The sum of unitaries can be hard to implement because the sum of unitaries, it isn't necessarily unitary. Now that, that might sound weird, but you can actually see, for example, i plus z over two, that's equal to the projector on the zero. So, the sum, sum of unitaries is, can, in some cases, be definitely non-unitary. And so, obviously, we're not going to be able to come up with a way of deterministically implementing this. So the idea is, OK, what we're going to do is we're going to take this sum of unitaries and we're going to build it in to the into a block of a larger unitary matrix. We'll then try to build this larger unitary matrix and use that to, uh, as our, to do our simulation. Okay, and for the case of our simulation, what we're what we'd want to do is we'd want to uh, start with an initial state, which is psi in one of the blocks, zero on the other, and then we'd like to ideally perform this operation on it. And if we measure the block, and we successfully end up finding a uh, a component up here, then we'll we'll have applied the sum of all of those unitary operators to the initial state. So it gives you a non-deterministic way of implementing any sum of unitaries you feel like, which means, in principle, any matrix you feel like. And that's amazing power that this technique ends up affording. And this is one of the reasons why it's become so popular, is that it's arguably the most flexible of all the simulation methods that have been developed so far. So I want to show you uh, uh, some specific intuition behind this. So let's say we wanted to add a whole bunch of different matrices together. The way that we would do this is say by using this particular circuit over here, where what we would do is we begin by pre preparing a uniform quantum superposition over all possible values of this register. Then if we've got two to the M different unitaries that we'd like to add together, what we do is we do, well, a zero controlled on zero, uh, U zero, then a one controlled U one, so on and so forth, all the way down. Then we do Hadamard our tensor n in the end. And in the event that all of these measurements turn out to be zero, then we enact this transformation over here. Okay, so you can and you can go through the math. It's very simple to va validate that this is uh, that this is actually the case. But that is basically how it ends up working. And you can use various flavors of amplitude amplification to be able to boost the success probability to 100% if you'd like. So that's how we would add a whole bunch of different matrices together. But you might think, hey, wait a second. If there's m qubits up here, then the cost of adding all of these different unitaries together will have to always go like 2 to the m, right? Because I have to do this one, then this one, all the way down to this one. But actually, that ain't true. So I'll get to that in a sec, but first I want to introduce some nomenclature. The, there's various parts of these types of circuits uh, that end up getting used over and over again. The two parts that we end up getting are the select and prepare circuit. What the prepare does is it prepares the weights, or i.e. the coefficients, for each of these individual terms in the sum. And select, what it does is it chooses which one of these used to apply. All right, so those are the two operations that uh, we're going to carry out. And actually this paradigm has become so important that uh, to be honest, it's now the most common um, or, uh, oracle model that people consider for doing Hamiltonian simulation. And so a final thing that I wanna bring up 
well, not quite final, is that linear combinations of unitaries is actually kind of an analogous to Monte Carlo methods. All right, so let me explain what I mean by that. So the way that I wanted to get at it is first, I wanted to get at the fact that in general, the complexity doesn't depend on the number of terms or the number of different unitaries we have. To see this, let's consider a really dumb case. Let's imagine that u0 were equal to u1. If that were the case, then this matrix over here and that one are the same, which means because the matrix gets fired, whether this is zero or whether this is one, we can actually simplify our circuit. And a simplification of the circuit would have no control down here. So in this particular case, you can see that, um, that basically the cost no longer ends up depending on two to the, uh, on two to the n. There's just as many different possible combinations when you think about this distribution over here, but when you're actually taking a look at the cost, now we've reduced the cost by, um, by uh, well, a small amount in this particular case, but we reduced it. In general, actually, all that we need to do for this is we need to just consider simplifying the select. So this select subroutine, all it needs to do is take a J input, which specifies a particular U to apply, and apply it. In some cases, that can be much more efficient than the, the original one. And to give you an idea about, about this, this actually ends up looking just like, um, just like a Monte Carlo sampling. So imagine what we wanted to do is we wanted to Monte Carlo sample applying a matrix to a vector. Okay, what we do is we, uh, we would draw a randomly a unitary to apply. Okay, and that's actually what the prepare circuit is doing here. It's creating a uniform um, distribution of what J to apply. This corresponds to some probability variant that we end up seeing over here. And then to figure out which one actually will end up getting applied, we would just kind of look up where it is in the cumulative distribution function and then say, oh, okay, well, in this case, 21 is the uh, unitary that ends up getting applied. So that's really what's going on here, except the only difference is that now, rather than this being a probabilistic uh, mixture that's going on, it's a quantum mixture. But the cool thing is about this is just like Monte Carlo, it actually doesn't directly depend on the dimension, i.e. the number of different unitaries that are showing up. The only thing that it depends on is how complicated it is to do this lookup. In the worst case scenario, where this is literally a lookup table and there's no structure for it to take advantage of, then yeah, that's going to go like two to the m. But more broadly, there's a ton of structure that usually ends up existing that we can take advantage of to make the cost of this over here in poly m. And in those cases, um, we can get some really, really nice uh, improvements. And so to give you an example of where this is, or, or where you can see this, I'd like to turn my attention to a slightly different problem. I'd like to talk about simulating a time-dependent Hamiltonian. And I only see this as fair because LCU is just so powerful that doing something like truncated Taylor, that's, that's too easy. So let's, let's look at simulating a time-dependent Hamiltonian. And the reason why I ultimately want to get to this is because of uh, the, the, the interaction picture simulation method, which I'll be uh, uh, getting to immediately after this. So let's make the assumption over here, just for simplicity, that uh, what we have is that we have um, a sub j of t is equal to one. And let's assume over here that this is just a single term in our Hamiltonian, okay? So we've just got one time-dependent term in our Hamiltonian that has a magnitude one. Now, we'd like to be able to think about how to write this as a, uh, the dynamics of this as a linear combination of unitaries. So in order to do this, I need to take that select block, which recall I mentioned is this part over here that takes a, a variant, like a value of J that's input and looks up which unitary we need to apply. And so because this is all time dependent, what we need to do is I, we need to now take in the time as an argument. So let's generalize this a little bit and specify the time as, uh, as a quantum input. 
So what select does is it takes time, which is stored as an integer, say, in this register and applies the unitary Hamiltonian, which I just assume for the simple case is unitary, to the state. Now, the time evolution operator, because u of t in general doesn't necessarily need to commute with itself, although it does for this simple case, it can be written as a, as a Dyson series expansion that looks like this. This is sort of the analog of a Taylor series expansion. So the idea behind this expansion over here now is that each one of these integrals that we have is a discrete sum. So the Dyson series in this case actually has already expressed the time evolution here as a sum of unitaries. So all we have to do now is just use this previous circuit over here to perform the time evolution. Okay, great. And furthermore, if there's a simple um, formula for figuring out what aj of t is, like, a, like an arithmetic circuit that can implement the correct phase kicking back, then this is all gonna be doable in time that's polynomial in a number of bits of precision. Also, I should mention that this series over here uh, truncates very quickly. It goes like t to the k over k factorial. So we really don't need to go very deep down these nested integrals over here. So the only technica technical issue that ends up coming up is just making sure that when we kind of Monte Carlo or we use our quantum circuit to randomly draw these t and t primes, that their arguments are chosen to be time ordered. That's the only technicality. And so when you take a look at my paper with Guang Hao that we did on this, you know, the vast majority of the text is actually set up just for making sure that we draw these times in the appropriate order. Um, but the, sim the idea itself is actually very simple. We just essentially use LCU to do a Monte Carlo average of all of these integrals. However, one of the things that, because this is just like a Monte Carlo average, the error that we end up getting, or the complexity of this, actually ends up kind of scaling like the variance of the quantities, which in our case scales like the absolute value, the sum of the absolute values of the aj of t. It doesn't actually end up scaling with the derivatives. In fact, the only reason why the derivatives come in at all with this kind of Monte Carlo-ish method for doing quantum simulation is because of the fact that we need logarithmically many bits in order to store the t with enough precision. That's it. So basically, what this ends up leading to is this conclusion that the number of queries that we need to prepare and select oracles in order to do the simulation is totally independent of the derivatives. And furthermore, the number of auxiliary gates that we need only scales polylogarithmically with the derivatives uh, through the length of this T register over here. So that's amazing. Every other known uh, method uh, ends up having a cost that scales polynomially with the derivatives, except this one. Oh, I should say every other, no, except for the uh, Q-drift. Q-drift is the only randomized algorithm that does this, but I, I won't have time to, to go into detail with that. And this ends up actually opening up a new possibility, which is the interaction picture. So the idea behind the interaction picture is, um, let me skip ahead. I, I wrote this in the wrong order. Um, so let's assume that what we wanna do with the interaction picture is we wanna do a frame transform in order to take a big part of our Hamiltonian out, which would normally dominate the, the cost of the simulation and turn that time independent simulation with a, with a huge term into a rapidly varying time dependent simulation. Because the previous method's cost doesn't depend on how rapidly the Hamiltonian changes, it only depends on the value, that trade-off can be actually quite profitable and actually give you an exponential advantage in some cases. Uh, but, Nathan, yeah. Um, there's a question in the chat um, that you might want to answer. Uh, Zeph Landau asked, why is it important to be talking about linear combinations of unitaries uh, as opposed to any other operator. Okay, well, deep down, it's the same sort of uh, reason, right? It's because the objects that we can, we can do naturally and, and cheaply on the quantum computer are, are unitary transformations. 
We could, of course, represent, you know, a linear combination of non-unitary transformations, but what we'd have to do is we'd have to propose some method for implementing those non-unitary uh, transformations. And the, mo the easiest way of doing it is using linear combinations of unitaries. So that's the, that's the biggest reason. It's, it's in principle possible, but we want to we want to make the you know objects on the right hand side of the equation simpler than the objects on the left hand side of the equation. So, and if we follow... so I think I think Nathan what uh, what Zef was uh, getting at maybe is that at the end of the day you took all these lin uh, you know unitaries the linear combination of them and you put them in a block of a matrix and then you made the the larger matrix unitary. Mm -hmm. So then where did it make a difference that the that the linear combination was of unitaries or of non-unitaries? Where, where did you actually make use of that at the end of the day? Yeah, at the end of the day, the main place where, where I, we make use of it is, um, is actually just in our uh, deployment of the Oracle. That's the biggest uh, usage that we end up having for it. So in order to be able to, in order to be, we need to be able to come up with a method of compiling all of this down to unitary operations that the quantum computer knows how to do. And so that's it. Mm -hmm. So in any case, I just wanted to quickly mention this idea of frame transformation. So all of you who've done, you know, uh, first year physics actually have worked with these kinds of frame transformations like we're using in the interaction picture. So let's just imagine that we've got somebody going around in a carousel. It's often more difficult to be able to solve for the dynamics of this in an inertial frame of reference because of the fact that there's some implicit time dependence of the carousel going up and down as it's spinning around. The problem becomes a lot easier if you remove that time dependence by going into a co-rotating frame where the radius of the, uh, of the person on the carousel is exactly the same. This leads to problems about uh, additional uh, potentially fictitious forces being included in the, the, the model, but it actually often makes things simpler. Ironically, what we want to do here is we want to do the reverse. We want to start with a system that looks time independent and transform over to this case that looks like an inertial reference frame. The reason why is because these extra terms that we normally would have had to have paid full price for in this picture now become rapid oscillations, like a rapid spin of the carousel. And because we don't pay a full, the full price for that, we only pay a log price for that, that's favorable. And so the key idea behind this is let's assume that our Hamiltonian is a sum of two pieces. We've got big and we've got small. Yeah, I know, real creative names. Um, so what I want to do is I want to transform into a rotating frame um, with respect to the big term. If I do that, then the way we could write this is this interaction picture simulation or interaction uh, picture uh, transformation over here, where psi i is the uh, state vector in this rotating frame. The Schrodinger equation, once we end up making this substitution, you can just go through the Schrodinger equation and rewrite it. And then you end up finding that the Hamiltonian in this rotating frame takes the following form, where it's now just a small times a rapidly rotating uh, unitary term. But as I said before, we don't pay a price for this rapid change uh, using the truncated Dyson series simulation method using LCU that I showed previously. And so basically the cost only ends up depending now on the small bit, not the big bit. And so this gives us a way where actually imagine that a big is, you know, goes like two to the n, and a small goes like n. In that particular case, the advantage that we can get by going into this rotating frame can be exponential. So that's something that's really kind of uh, amazing about the interaction picture simulation method. So the last method that I want to talk about is cubitization. And the basic goal behind cubitization is that what we want to do is we'd like to be able to build a simple quantum walk operator that in some sense is equivalent to e to the minus IHT in a, in a higher dimensional space. The cool thing about this is the language used to describe cubitization is exactly the same language as in linear combination of unitaries. We have our prepare and our select circuit where the prepare circuit ends up building uh, this alpha state over here where 
in our context, alpha is um, just sum over j square root alpha sub j over a normalization constant lambda j. And our Hamiltonian that we're going to want to ultimately work with will be sum over j alpha j uh, uj. And select, again, will implement the corresponding uj's. So that is uh, how this works. Now, what we do is let's just assume for simplicity, we don't need to assume this, but let's assume for simplicity that select is unitary and Hermitian. That means select squared equals one. That also means that select is a reflection operator. So then this walk operator, which I'll claim, ends up actually implementing a, poly, a, a transformation of the Hamiltonian effectively up to some isometries. That ends up uh, being a reflection operator. So this over here, really, for the particular case that, I, uh, that I'll be discussing, is just a pair of reflection operators. So this ends up looking exactly like Grover's search. So we can understand what this walk operator, which I've given over here, does. So this first thing, we have to apply the select operator. We can go through, and if we represent the initial state, which is this alpha uh, tensor EK, this over here I've assumed is an eigenvalue uh, or an eigen uh, vector. And uh, this over here again is stores all the uh, coefficients of H. Okay, so initially let's assume we start with all of those coefficients of H in quantum superposition up here, tensored with an eigenvector. We begin by preparing, applying the select operation which we can actually argue is a reflection about this up to a global phase. Now, what we need to do is we need to do the following reflection about the prepare state, which is the initial state. So when we do that, we're going to reflect about this and end up right back here. And so this looks exactly like the analysis behind Grover search, exactly like it. In fact, you can actually just regurgitate everything out of Mike and Ike in order to go through and figure out what the form of the rotation operator inside this two-dimensional space is. When you do that, you end up finding that the, uh, rotation, the, the rotation operator inside this two-dimensional space takes this form, which you, we can simplify to that matrix over here. So we can see that this walk operator ends up being very, uh, having eigenvalues that are, look exactly like the previous ones except that these ones were going to be plus minus the arc cosine of the original eigenvalues rather than just the eigenvalues. So we can fix that up using a, a set of techniques known as quantum um, signal processing. You can also use linear combinations of unitaries to fix this up or other, you know, in most cases, actually, we don't even bother trying to fix it up. Because normally, if we're interested in learning the energies, say for a, a chemistry simulation problem, well, it's good enough to just do phase estimation on W and then take the cosine of the answer. We don't need to use any fancy tricks in order to quantumly transform the arc cosine back when we can use a calculator. So that's the, the core idea behind, um, behind how we use the um, uh, cubitization. So if you learn nothing more from this talk, I would say this slide is probably, as ugly as it is, the most useful slide in the entire deck. Because what it gets across is why we would want to use these different techniques. Now, I want to reiterate, none of the techniques is strictly better than any of the other techniques. There's always things that one of these three methods does better than the rest. Trotter-Suzuki methods, don't scale as well when it comes to the air tolerance or the evolution time as the other methods. However, they require no extra qubits. And on top of that, their air depends on the commutators, not how big the individual terms are. So there are going to be some problems with big terms and small commutators where the Trotter-Suzuki air that we end up getting over here is far, far better than the sum of the absolute values of the coefficients that we get here. The LCU methods, they're incredibly flexible. You can do just about everything that you want with them. Downside is that we don't get the quite as good scaling as cubitization, which is optimal. And, but 
we end up, the technique works for time dependent Hamiltonians and also allows us to do through that the interaction picture. Cubitization, its big advantage is that it's got the provably optimal query complexity. And so if the place to use it really is if there's no self-evident symmetry in the particular problem that you're, you're working with that you could take advantage of using LCU or Trotter. In that, those cases, cubitization is your sledgehammer. And that's the one that you should really swing at those particular problems. And this, that's why for problems in chemistry in particular, cubitization is usually my favorite method. But for other problems that might have more structure, I, I tend to prefer Trotter or LCU methods. So now what I'd like to do is I'd like to give you very quickly an introduction to three different simulation uh, uh, applications that we've taken a look at. One uh, uh, chosen each uh, to end up uh, um, uh, so that they're, or one each, each of, uh, of them is uh, optimal for one of the different methods that I've discussed. So the first one that I'll discuss is quantum electrodynamics simulations. And in particular, what we're going to look at is the uh, simulation of the Schwinger model, which is QE, models QED in one plus one dimensions. Now, I won't bother going too much into the details of how this model works, but the basic idea is that each of these individual sites you can think of as just a qubit. So this is, you know, like zero or one that stores whether there's an electron or a positron here. This green bar over here, think of this as a QDID. It's a register uh, that we've cut off lambda over there. That ends up determining how much electric field or electric flux there, there is but, uh, uh, between the two sites. And so basically the interactions in this particular system uh, between the electrons and positrons and electrons and other electrons aren't mitigated by uh, like putting in a direct force in there. All of it is inferred by Gauss's law from the fluxes that we end up seeing uh, out here. In any case, the Hamiltonian is this guy over here. Key thing about all of this is that the electric energy that we end up getting ends up scaling like the sum of the squares of the values up here. So if we have n sites here, this would be order n lambda squared for it. Now, lambda is often a big, big number because we don't know how the electric field is going to group for the dynamics of a bunch of electrons or positrons, even in one dimension. So we've got to make sure that we keep enough inside each of these locations in order to be able to store a huge electric field. And so this term ends up dominating the sum. However, there's only one term that it actually ends up having a non-trivial uh, uh, commutator with which is this interaction term. Oh, this bottom one over here is just the mass of the individual ones. And because of the fact that the commutators are nice, well, that just screams, use Trotter Suzuki on this guy. So that's what we did. Um, this is work I did with um, um, uh, Jesse Stryker, Alex Shaw, Pavel Lugowski. And so what we ended up finding for this particular case is that if lambda again is the cutoff, T is the evolution time, and N is the number of fermionic sites, the cost for Trotter Suzuki, it scales a little bit worse when it comes to the evolution time and the number of sites than cubitization, but it scales quadratically better with the cutoff. And so for in this case, we save qubits and we save time by using actually a simpler quantum simulation method than cubitization. So that's one of the reasons why it's really important to know not just which technique ends up giving in abstract the best, uh, of the best uh, uh, performance, but rather you need to know why it gives it. So that way you can choose the right technique to take advantage of the structure in your particular problem. Another one, I, I promise you an interaction picture example. Let's talk about simulating materials in a plane wave dual basis. So this Hamiltonian that I drew over here this is the Hamiltonian that basically just describes a Coulomb Hamiltonian. So it's the ordinary Hamiltonian that describes electrostatic attraction and repulsion between um, uh, electrons, nuclei, the works. So this really describes all of chemistry. The only thing that we ended up uh, assuming on top of that is we ended up assuming that we have a periodic lattice 
which ends up reduce, killing off some of the terms that would have been present otherwise. But it, so this really is kind of most appropriate for materials. In any case, key thing about this is that you, we have this term over here. This ends up giving the energy for two electrons talking to each other. So we've got two electrons at different sites in your lattice, say here and here. This term ends up giving you the energy uh, of it, where n counts the presence or of an electron at a given site. And so this term actually ends up dominating the cost of the simulation. It is far bigger than any of the other ones. And it's also diagonal, which means that it's actually easy to fast forward and use with the interaction picture. So when we transform into an interaction frame of this guy, which is our biggest offender, we end up getting complexity for the simulation that scales like uh, n squared t. Whereas if we use cubitization, which I remind you can't take advantage of the interaction picture, the asymptotic complexity goes more like n to the 11 thirds. And so this shows an example of where you can take advantage of known structure for the particular Hamiltonian that you're, you're looking at uh, to end up getting an advantage through uh, the interaction picture. Now, finally, as I said before, you know, there's the, there's the big sledgehammer in the, in the game. And we're going to want to take the sledgehammer out from time to time. And chemistry is exactly the right kind of problem for this. So for chemistry, we were, look, we were looking at in this uh, paper with um, uh, the folks at Google, uh, as well as uh, uh, Junho Lee, the, um, we were looking at the simulation of uh, this molecule that I've, uh, I've unfortunately inflicted upon the field called FOMOCO. Don't worry, I'm not going to talk about biological nitrogen fixation. But anyways, the um, key thing is, is that this molecule is very complicated and expressed in an extremely complicated basis. So any structure which might have been self-evident has been washed away in all of the chem uh, quantum chemistry packages. And because that's all gone, then this is a perfect target for a, a method that works well in brute force situations like cubitization. And we end up finding actually world leading results in this uh, where we showed that this molecule can basically be simulated on the order of a few billion operations, which is a world records to my knowledge for a useful simulation problem. But it's worth mentioning actually that all that these four techniques down at the bottom actually are all cubitization. And it's not a coincidence. It's because of the fact that the problem doesn't really lend itself to being torn apart using any of the other approaches. And so that's why we hit it with the asymptotically best method and we get the best results uh, for that. So, those are hopefully some ideas. There's some intuition that I can give you about what the different Hamiltonian simulations uh, do and why you should uh, use them. One of the things that though, there's a bunch of open questions I think that are raised. Once you have these basic tools, there's many questions about how to end up using them properly with each other. First question is, well, we've got these three methods, right? None of them end up strictly beating each other. So the question is, are there ways that we can borrow? Can we, can we think, figure out ways of intelligently using some of the features of Trotter, some of the features of um, LCU or cubitization and put them together in such a way as to take advantage of partial structure in parts of, uh, parts of a harder problem? And recent work that I've done with uh, uh, Guang Hao as well as Vadim Kluchnikov has shown that you can do we can do this with multi-product formulas, but I feel there's a lot more work left to be done in this particular space. Uh, another issue is that because of the fact that cubitization doesn't work for time-dependent Hamiltonians, we really actually can't get the optimal scaling with the, the error for, um, for time-dependent simulations because LCU scales multiplicatively with the logarithm of the error tolerance, not additively. And so uh, an open question that, I, that I'm really curious about is, is it possible to bridge that gap? Can you, can you uh, come up with a simulation algorithm for time-dependent Hamiltonians in general that's going to have uh, additive co complexity in the logarithm of the air? But a bigger question is, well, not all of quantum dynamics 
has naturally has a Hamiltonian. There's actually many problems in quantum field theory where it's much more natural to begin with a Lagrangian rather than a Hamiltonian. And so the question is, in one of these approaches, such as the path integral formalism, or if you're thinking even more funky like, you know, what about some other really strange vision of uh, quantum dynamics, like um, say, uh, say simulating um, uh, Bohmian mechanics? It, are these just as efficient as present day quantum simulation methods? Or are there additional considerations that need to be made? So my hope is that we'll eventually tra transition beyond Hamiltonian simulation and have a more complete understanding of what simulating quantum dynamics looks like under assumptions about different types of oracles than the kind that we currently have, which only give us information about the Hamiltonian. And this question, I hope, will actually eventually allow us to shed some light on, to me, what one of the biggest open questions for quantum computing is, which is, the question of whether or not quantum computers actually can simulate all of physical theory, and in particular, whether they can simulate the standard model of physics. And having quantum simulation methods that can meet the descriptions that physicists use for these more esoteric models uh, in the middle, I think it might potentially offer a valuable step towards this goal of understanding really what the computational power of the universe is. Thank you very much. Thanks, Nathan. Um, I, uh, thanks for the great talk. Let's um, we should turn to questions. Uh, yeah. Um, so Samuel Palmer asks, which of these techniques are most relevant for NIST devices? By far, hands down, no questions asked, Trotter. The reason why is that for NIST devices, uh, qubits are, come at a major premium. And so for that reason, having a space optimal method like Trotter Suzuki is, uh, is actually the best. Um, the other thing though, that's also worth taking a look at is some of the randomized simulation methods like, uh, like QDrift or uh, other variants that, uh, that are related to it. Uh, those also are space optimal. Uh, another question by Nicolas Salaya is that, well, it says that uh, you are covering electronic structure in two of, of the three like examples that you had. And well, like in, in one, one was uh, more than than other. And, and he continues like, do you have a sense for which Hamiltonian simulation method would be best for qubit based simulations of bosons, including molecular and mat material vibrations of the bose hubbard models? Ah, excellent question. Excellent, excellent question. Yeah, um, okay. So for bosons, bosons are tough because of the fact that what you have is uh, you have this exact same problem with the Schwinger model where you have to deal with very large cutoffs and the compilation uh, using most of the techniques that people have shown so far in the space down to simple unitaries actually is inefficient. So um, I, the, the approach that I think is best uh, to do is, so far seems to actually be the interaction picture um, because of the fact that we, I generally, in order to be able to, um, the cutoffs that I often have to worry about for bosonic models, for, uh, for the bosonic degrees of freedom can often be quite large and I don't wanna have to pay full price for them. And so by going into a rotating frame, I can ignore that. And so, so far preliminary work that I've done seems to suggest that that's asymptotically going to be the right way of going about it. But if you're looking for the NISC, going back to the previous question, I think that, um, I think that uh, a randomized approaches like a, a time dependent Q drift uh, in the interaction frame is actually going to be the best way of doing with that. Okay, I, I have one more question. Uh, so in one of the last slides, you, you showed uh, some new, new results where you achieved the best uh, complexity so far for, for Tamoko and other uh, simulations. <clears throat> and, and you said that it's, uh, it's, it's based on some tensor hypercontraction uh, hyper uh, techniques. Can you just say a word on, on what that means? Sure. So basically what the, the whole idea is, is that what we do is we normally, when we're doing electronic structure, we have all of these different terms 
that are generated by the electronic structure package. And there's no real self-evident structure that's exposed to the human for this. So what we do is we can actually re-express that sum as a, as a uh, contraction of, a, of a, a set of tensors. And then once we form that, we have this ability to now be able to do a singular value um, uh, truncation of those tensors that we end up forming, which allow us to kind of control the amount of accuracy that we end up getting versus the number of terms that the, the whole thing ends up expanding into. And this is, this is one of the key things that ends up giving us a big advantage. The other advantage that we end up getting, which actually is more interesting from an algorithmic perspective, is that we actually formally are working in a non-orthogonal basis uh, when we're, we're doing this. So actually our, uh, our basis vectors, when we represent the simulation, have some actual you know, small overlap with each other. And we use this in order to allow it to actually explore a higher dimensional Hilbert space and partially compensate with the um, error we get from truncating some of the singular values of these uh, tensors. And that's what, and we're doing, this gives us slightly better asymptotic scaling theoretically um, if we're willing to accept these, these errors along the way and we make some assumptions about how the singular values behave. But the, um, the, 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 in practice, really all of this hard work boiled down to a factor of two better than the, the best previous result. <laughs> so we're starting to get to the point where there are continual mammoth you know, advances that are happening, but now we're, now we're beginning to fight over factors of two. And uh, that to me is kind of you know, exciting and uh, you know, frightening all at the same time. So actually, um... Continuing on that, um, I guess I had questions at two ends of the spectrum. One is, um, given that you're already at these factors of two, so how, you know, um, I'm, I'm not sure I misread, whether I misread the numbers on the previous slide um, in terms of the number of qubits, but, uh, sorry, in the next one, uh, yeah. Yeah, so, uh, so the, uh, I as, see, you, so, as you can see, this is clearly a NISC application. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so, so, uh, so, what, what, what do you think? Uh, you know, what are the prospects of uh, of um, something useful being being possible on on you know NISC like or you know at at what stage would something useful happen and where in all this do you see this happening? Truth is, is that I really don't know if somebody. Um, I don't know exactly where this is going, going to happen, but the gulfs between the numbers of what we can do right now mm. and these, which are still the best, like to my knowledge, these are the absolute best numbers anybody's ever found for a uh, useful application for a quantum computer. Mm. The gulf is just so wide between that, that even if this is pessimistic by a factor of a hundred, when it comes to the gate count, we're still many orders of magnitude away from what we realistically could do. I think that if we're hoping that we're going to see some sort of an advantage from NISC era hardware, it's got to be for a completely different application. And I don't know what that application would be. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then um, at the other end of the spectrum where you were talking about um, uh, uh, simulating the standard model on a yeah. on a on a on a quantum computer. So, um, can can you can you go over what the what the gaps there are? Wonderful. Yeah. So the basic idea behind this is that the the biggest problem is that the standard model, from the perspective of an algorithms guy, is that the standard al uh, model is all given in terms of a Lagrangian, which is isn't a matrix. Like, uh, like we would be dealing with in a Hamiltonian. It's literally like an energy function that, and that where you end up giving um, basically uh, uh, two positions and you can uh, figure out what the Lagrangian density or the integral of it is between these. And it turns out that if you use a, the path integral representation for quantum dynamics, then the time evolution can be described as a sum over all possible trajectories that a particle could follow from the beginning uh, of some process to some final configuration. 
where the phase that it, that particle will end up picking up will be given by the integral of the Lagrangian. So what you have to do with that simulation, if you want to do that literally exactly as written, is you'd have to sum over this exponentially large number of paths with all of these terms that are wildly oscillating up and down. And the problem is, is that the vast majority of these paths are going to almost entirely cancel. But if you use a technique like linear combination of unitaries, the cost ends up scaling like the absolute value of the sum of all of those terms that are canceling out. So you actually get something that's very analogous to the sign problem if you try to implement literally uh, the dynamics in a path integral formalism. And so, so, so I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not, I'm not really following, you know, so, so the, the kind of problems you're raising about, um, you know, cancellations and so on, well, that, that's exactly what a quantum computer helps us do. So, so you know, uh, but in terms of your formulation, uh, what, what is it that's different? So, so you, you're not given a Hamiltonian, but you're given, so what's, 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 the, what's the small input to the problem which describes the initial conditions and, and the dynamics that, that, that we want to emulate? The problem, Umesh, is that the paths that you're summing over, there's no a priori importance about the paths. Mm -hmm. So if you have an oracle coming in, that oracle may not have any idea about whether or not some trajectory that it could consider is going to be more uh, lead to more cancellation than another. When, if we've got a Hamiltonian, especially a sparse one, right? We know that the, the dynamics is going to be confined to some sort of an area, but we don't have any spatial information whatsoever when we just uh, specify it in a path integral representation. We only have the degree of phase cancellation. And the quantum computer, I, I, I've never figured it out and I don't believe anybody else has figured out a way of uh, actually without having promises about either locality for the Lagrangian or mm -hmm. uh, importances of these different paths that you're summing up. I really don't know how to efficiently implement that sum even on a quantum computer. Mm -hmm. And so that's one of the big challenges and I, I think Part of me thinks that the original problem, as stated, might actually be uh, in, a, in a complexity class that's too hard for quantum computers to realistically be able to pull it off. But mm -hmm. I haven't been able to prove it. That's just my crazy conjecture. And so this is going beyond the fact that, um, beyond quantum field theory and whether that's, that can be simulated. And so from that perspective, what my conjecture is, is that the, there's a lot more information that's provided in a Hamiltonian-based formalism of dynamics than a Lagrangian-based formalism, even if the two are technically equivalent. Mm -hmm. and, the, and the extra information can sometimes allow us to come up with an efficient uh, method for simulating it on a quantum computer, but nobody knows how to do it without that extra information. Uh, great. Uh, there are no other questions. We can we can continue continue the discussion in small groups on Gather Town. Uh, I wonder if we can put it on the on the chat. Uh, let, me, let me try to put the put the link on the chat. Uh, um, but um, yeah, in the you know uh, uh, you know thanks again for for a really. Uh, uh, very thought-provoking talk, and uh, uh, let me let me just put uh, put the uh, the Gather Town link on the on the chat and on the Q and A. So thanks everybody for attending, and and uh, uh, thanks Nathan again. Thank you everybody for for coming. <laughs>